So what's going on this evening? We had our hot seat competition this month. That hot seat competition was for, that was Read Across America, right, Dr. Uh, Dr. Seuss? Here's a funny story about Read Across America. As a kid, I had the book, Green Eggs and Ham. And I could not read, but I memorized that book. And I read the book for my grandparents one day and my grandparents was like, y'all do know Marky can't read. She just memorized the book. And at that point, my mother sent me to IIT here in the city of Chicago. I had to go to private tutoring on Saturdays for three hours in the second grade because I did not know how to read. So, um, but I loved green eggs and ham, baby. Uh, so that was my favorite <laughs> book because I had memorized it. Uh, so just something interesting. What's going on tonight, Kim? Hey, Marky, how are you? I'm wonderful. Uh, we loved your video. We loved your book recommendation. You did a fabulous job uh, with your competition. I am noticing that people who create videos tend to stand out more in the feed, so they are definitely getting more engagement with their posts. So I want to congratulate you on being a brave soul and stepping out, creating that great video with great recommendations and sharing a part of yourself. So I'm sitting here in the hot seat today night. That means, uh-oh, you get to ask me anything. And I see you got your lit background, your bookshelf set up. Is that a fern? You got your, you got your <laughs> flowers. You got a million dollar flower sitting over in the corner, right? Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. From non-reader, exactly. From not, couldn't read. It was, it was pretty bad, but so be it. My mother got me all the way together. Okay. I'm in the hot seat. I'm ready. I got my tea. I'm sipping on my tea. So go on and kick it off. Let's see what you got for me tonight. Awesome. First of all, I am truly honored to be in the hot seat. I'm a brand new agent. I haven't had my entire year yet. It's going to be next month. Um, so a little background, um, just so you can kind of preface where my questions are going to be directed. So I started my career in real estate in April 2020 in the middle of lockdown. I just moved to Illinois then, I had zero network. Um, but my interest in real estate actually started in 2017 when I spent half of my savings to join a real estate flipping course. Um, the next year I did a joint venture with someone who did the course, uh, had my then boyfriend take out a $100,000 loan put in the rest of my savings on there so that we can invest together. Long story short, our joint venture partner actually took advantage of the fact that we had little experience and we lost $150,000. So that was an incredibly hard hit and it's still this really heavy thing on my chest to this day. So we're trying to not give up because I honestly feel that real estate is the best avenue for creating general um, generational wealth for your family. I, you know, decide to be a realtor. So I definitely would like to still invest later down in the future. So with that background, what I'd really love to focus on today is mindset, momentum, and discipline, because that is the areas that I feel that I need the most and hopefully, you know, other newbies can help, uh, you know, learn something from this. So with that, my first question, you've, all, you've always had that entrepreneurial mindset that is essential in starting a business. What is your advice on how to develop and cultivate that mindset if you don't already have it? I wanna say something before we get into your first question. Um, when I came into real estate, I was already an entrepreneur, but I made my then boyfriend, my GC, my general contractor. We successfully bought and rehabbed seven houses. However, however, he was not faithful and I knew he was not faithful when a woman decided to call me one day from his house. What I knew was that he was not my God sent man, but I had all these outstanding projects with him. 
And so I made up in my mind that I was going to finish my projects and that I would be honest with anyone who approached me. In comes my husband. He asked me um, if I had a boyfriend. I told him yes. I said, I am in a fragile, highly dysfunctional relationship. But anything short of me falling in love and getting married, I will not be leaving my dysfunction because I know exactly what I'm dealing with. I decided I fell in love with my husband and that I was going to leave my dysfunction. As a result of me leaving my dysfunction, you know your boyfriend ain't going to act right when you quit him for the next man, right? Uh, so they overlapped for about six months telling all my business. And essentially, I lost about $300,000 as the result of leaving my boyfriend for my other boyfriend that is now my husband, <laughs> okay? Let me tell you that um, everything happens for a reason. Me leaving him and sacrificing, because it was a sacrifice, sacrificing that amount of money, everything just came back over time. It wasn't quick. It's taken a long time. I left him back in uh, October of 2005. And it took about seven to 10 years for things to get financially good again. And if I had it to do it all over again, I would have left his butt all over again. So when you're in the midst of going through that, it's, um, it's very hard to gauge what the future is going to um, hold for you. But the only thing I can promise you is that it is greater later. And you want to remain diligent to what you are passionate about. Because once it starts to manifest itself, you're going to feel better. You're going to understand why everything that happened between 2017 and 2018 occurred. With saying that, I want to thank you for being bold and being vulnerable and sharing what you have gone through and the fact that you came into real estate in April of 2020 after relocating to a new city in the midst of a pandemic that no one could have ever predicted to a city that has experienced great, and I mean great substantial uh, social unrest that uh, it already tells me a lot about who you are as a person. So I know that you're bold and I know that you aren't faint at heart because you have navigated this far. So coming back to the mindset, I often think that I'm great. I'm grateful and thankful for being in the world of real estate right now. I was born and raised as an entrepreneur. My great grandmother sent six kids to college uh, on a paper stand and my great grandfather sold popcorn in the neighborhood. So when I say very humble beginnings, they lived in essentially a one bedroom shack and it was them, their six kids and their two grandchildren. And one of those grandchildren uh, was my mother. So I was raised in a household with a, a prayerful, thankful, great grandmother. Um, and I am the product of a village. So when I came, when I was born, even though my parents were teen parents, I am the next child after my mother on my mother's side and the child after my father's sister, who was about six, she was 16 at the time. So it's kind of like all hands on deck. And you might have seen that I have these mustard seeds um, that because of my mom, because she told me to always have the faith of a mustard seed. And when we think about this mustard seed, you know, these mustard seeds are very, very small. All I think about is the fact that, and that's real small, that my mother quit her job to go sell hot dogs in the park when I was 12 years old. And there was a lot of um, shame that kind of came with that because I attended a private school with, um, I would call them snobs, they were snobs. Um, and, <laughs> My mother drove a 68 Plymouth in 1979, so that was a problem too. And they would tease me about the fact that my mother sold hot dogs in the park. It wasn't until the summer of 1986 that I had the opportunity to go to Iceland as a foreign exchange student. So I lived in Reykjavik, Iceland for 10 weeks. And when I came back home, Michael Cummins, I'll never forget, signified, and he was like, so lemons, how many hot dogs did your mama have to sell in the park this summer in order to send you to Iceland, right? 
And I laughed because by now I can count. And I said, well, clearly my mama making more money than your mama making since she paying the same tuition your mama paying. I went to Iceland this summer and I have a car. Would you like a ride home, Michael? And that's when I realized the true joy of entrepreneurship and that things aren't what they always visually appear to be. Had I not had my mother to lay eyes on to see what she endured in order to be self-employed, I might not be as strong, but my mother was a teen parent. So essentially I was raised with her as well, right? And she just grabbed me by the hand and we I, I didn't have a choice. So I quit working for my mother. I think I was about 16 or 17 because she would forget sometimes that I was her daughter. <laughs> And if she got mad, she got mad. And she said whatever she wanted to say. Look, Kirk Franklin don't have nothing on what my mama might have said about her mouth. If you've heard the Kirk Franklin, uh, what he said to his child. And so I told my mother I quit because I didn't like how she would disrespect me. And my mother told me I couldn't quit. That we were in this together. And that I needed to get my emotions in order because we had a job to do. And so when things get rough now, you know, I question sometimes being an entrepreneur like anyone else, but I consistently have my mother, her voice in my head playing. And I remember seeing her and everything that she had to endure to open a food truck, essentially, in 1982. Food trucks weren't popular then. To go against the grain in a male-dominated, essentially, industry and to make it happen every single day. Um, and so I have had the opportunity to lose everything two times. The time that I told you about leaving Ron. And then I went through a bitter lawsuit with my family back in 1999, which is how I came to real estate. Uh, my family owns Chicago's second oldest Black restaurant. We've sold more pork rib tips. You might have heard me say this before than anyone else. We've been in business since 1954. Uh, essentially, my son would have been fourth generation in that business. My father's sister sued me because I own the trademark right. And to me, when someone sues you, the polite thing to do is to counter sue them. So behind every lawsuit is a counter lawsuit. In hindsight, them suing me was the best thing that ever happened to me because I'm self-made at this point. Did, did they give me a foundation? Yes. Did they educate me? Yes. But I'm not successful because my grandfather gave me a business or because my mother gave me a business. I'm successful because I was pushed out of a business and had to use those skill sets to reestablish myself. So all I can tell you is it, it is definitely going to get uh, better, but you have to have a business plan. So let me go back. I have had great success because I've always built a business not based on emotion, based 100% on the numbers. I did not come into real estate as a broker. I came into real estate as a licensed loan. Well, I wasn't even licensed at the time. I came in as a loan originator uh, in 1999. And then in 2004, the state of Illinois made loan originators go through what they called a provisional licensing period. Now, let me tell you how I pivoted to real estate because I was sitting down looking at that business plan and I would have had to originate 141 loans to earn the amount of money I wanted to earn. And at the time I was a single or unwedded parent. I don't like to say single because I, I always had a man to help me do something. Um, so I was a single, <laughs> I mean, unwedded. No, what did word ever I was using? Godly, I was unwedded, I wasn't single. Um, and so with that being said, the numbers told me that if I decided to just focus on real estate sales, I would not have to do 101 141 transactions. So actually my son came up here yesterday to pull the numbers up because he wanted to know about this 2004 award, which was my first full-time year selling real estate. Because I had that business plan, it is what attributed to the, the success and the longevity. So I would say spend some more time on going as deep as possible on the business plan because you already, you already got guts, right? 
But you look at this business plan and you looking at sales awards and you're consistently saying to yourself, I can do this. So-and-so did it. I know I can do it. And then you put yourself and you start hanging around those top producers and you realize they don't have nothing you don't already have. So now the question is, how do you tweak to perfection who you already are and what you already have? Uh, did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you actually, I feel like you answered my second question, which was what was one of your biggest failures and how did you use it to catapult you to where you are? Um, so but I don't know if you have any additions to that. Well, yeah, because I've had some... Um, some failures, but I'm going to take you back to a one bit previously. So I've been self-employed since the young tender age of 10. I asked for one too many pair of designer jeans and I had to start selling snowballs in front of our barbecue restaurant in order to buy my Jordache, Gloria Vanderbilt, uh, what is it, Sergio Valente. I had this whole list of jeans and my mother was like, girl, please, um, I need you to, one, you can't buy everything you want and don't buy what you need. You're going to start working this summer and you got to take care of your needs before you take care of your wants. So I had my first restaurant, though, at the age of 21, and I had to close the restaurant down. And to me, you know, you 21, you think anything is possible. What that taught me was that I was not as smart as I thought I was and that I needed to go and get more education. <clears throat> Hence the reason I have a master's degree. So I have a master's degree because my first restaurant failed kind of let you know. Then I went through another program called the Women's Self-Employment Project. So I have an MBA degree, but I wanted to launch our barbecue sauce, meat rub, our barbecue sauce, meat rub, and hot links. But I didn't know anything about business startup. So what I decided to do was I needed to learn about business startup. So I went through the Women's Self-Employment Project a lot of people in the city, women who own companies, they've also been through the Women's Self-Employment Project. But while I was there, I met Earthren Cousin. Earthren Cousin was part of past President Obama's cabinet to foreign aid uh, ministry. And so she gave me at the time she was the VP at Jewels. She gave me shelf space for the barbecue sauce, the meat rub and the hot links. That is what actually led to my father's sister suing me. It was the publicity of getting the space. Just so, but the biggest one would definitely be the lawsuit with my family because it, I, me and my, I haven't been cool with my father's sister, my, my father, none of his sisters since. I, we just ain't been cool. Um, and I tried to, I thought that me settling the lawsuit with them my countersuit to them. So their lawsuit was thrown out and we had to go to mediation on my lawsuit against them because I had what they wanted. But the judge said they would not listen to that family nonsense. That's essentially what the judge said and said we had to go to mediation. So I thought me settling the lawsuit and not getting them from every dime that I was entitled to um, would, bring, would bring us, like my father, sister would leave it alone and me and my grandfather could resume my relationship. But my father, sisters, it was already jealousy and animosity. They would not let it go. So it wasn't necessarily the business failure. It was the inability to get back um, on the same footing with my grandfather. I'm okay, okay with not being cool with my father, sisters. But it had been years of jealousy and dissension um, from private school, cars, trips, my grandfather gave me my first building and they did they never appreciated any of it. So it was the the loss of family, not necessarily the loss of business. Right. So this isn't written in my questions, but just because of what you're saying, how do you get past that? You know, the falling out of your family and just learning to accept that that's done. Cause I get really attached to people and especially if it's family or, you know, people you build long relationships with. A couple of things. Uh, one therapy therapy is needed. And I am very vested in therapy 
because one, I wasn't always right and nothing is sliced so thin, there aren't two sides to it. So therapy. The next thing is the landmark form. The landmark form helped change my life. And when I think about the landmark form, you know, some people think it's a coat, coat, whatever. Um, my former business partner, Rita Glass, she passed away, but Rita went to stage four cancer like three times. She'd leave here, she'd go to Florida. We swear she had some special mixture down in Florida she was taking. She'd come back and she in remission, right? A couple of years later, she get cancer again. She'd go to Florida, she'd come back. But Rita was very big in the landmark and she made everybody who she had a partnership with, she mandated that we go to landmark. So landmark, when you hear me say things, um, I'll give you an example. My aunt said that she was nice to my husband. I said, no, you're not nice to my husband. She says, well, I sent you guys uh, to the Dominican. I said, that doesn't mean you're nice. It means you sent us on a trip. So I'm very specific because people will say, well, you know, I've been so good to you. Yeah, but you're abusive. Yeah, but I've been good to you. No, no, you've just been abusive. You know what I'm saying? So how to put everything exactly what it is. The next thing is to assess your relationships and what they really mean to you. And the way that I've learned to assess my relationships is you can love a person and not like them. I want you to think about this. So I could, I could spend the rest of my life hanging out with you, glad to see you every single day if I like you and do not love you. However, you're gonna be miserable being around people who you love and you do not like. So I have decided that I'm clear there are people who I love, a lot of relatives, I love them. I don't ever want anything bad to happen to them. I don't wish bad on them, ill, nothing. But I don't like them as people. Therefore, at the point that I don't like you, I can't be around you because I simply don't like you. Like you make my skin crawl. You agitate my soul. Um, and a lot of people, and even when you think about relationships, right? How many people stay in a bad relationship? I love him. Yeah, he make you feel gushy. That don't mean you like him. So whether I like you or, or love you, so I prefer to be around people who I like and respect versus people I necessarily love. And um, besides that, if you've been gone for any period of time, I ask myself, do I miss you? And what I've realized, I don't miss them. And it's, it's hard to admit to yourself and sometimes it's even heart-wrenching, but the people who I've spent a great deal of time with who I don't spend time with today, it is because I don't miss them. I'm not encouraged to spend time with them. Um, it was a period of life. It was good when it was good. Uh, so those are my two things, that whole like versus love. And it's good to have both, right? Like that's the ideal situation. And I realized that from past relationships, there were men who I just love, but I didn't like them. And once I left, because I did not like them, I did not miss them. And once I realized I don't miss you, it's like this. So I know, and then your contribution, like do people make you better? And do people aid you in getting to your personal goals? Uh, people who I tend to spend a lot of time with, we have a lot of things in common. We like volunteering, we love entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is often lonely. This is, it can be lonely. That's why you will see me with a Carrie, a Sarah Ware, because we come from contribution. We all love education. We all grind at the same rate. And you don't feel, I don't feel like it's a, a one-sided relationship. But at one time I did feel a little lonely when I had decided to leave my ex for my husband. My husband is not an entrepreneur. So at that time, I've invested a lot of time and energy at the Polsky Center at the University of Chicago to put myself around people who were like-minded and entrepreneurial. And it, it actually allowed me to pivot my business. So I've had a lot of little programs that I've gone through because I realized there was something missing and I wanted to change whatever, whatever that environment was. So the Polsky Center, 
um, which used to be the Center of Innovation Exchange, helped me out a lot, and the Women's Self-Employment Project. Girl, you, whew, I'm, this is going to be a, this emotional, girl. <laughs> Keep going. Jeez Louise. Somebody else said they are a true fan of therapy. Baby, therapy is everything. And this is what I love about everybody I've gone to therapy with. When I went, this is going to sound crazy. Um, the last time that I went for an extended period of time, I realized that this whole love like, right? I realized that 100% love my children. I adore them. But that oldest one, when he became grown, I loved him. I was still paying tuition, had an apartment in DC that I never graced the front door of, but I didn't like him. Like I wanted to lay hands on that boy. And so I went to therapy to help me through why, how could you birth this child and you don't like the man that he's morphing into? And that's because he had pledged, he was feeling himself. I mean, he thought he was the man. And um, we, we're past that now, but I went because that was very hard for me because one of my goals was to always have a very close relationship with my children like I had with my mother. And I'm like, well, what am I doing wrong? So my therapist, one day I'm leaving, she says, she, she reprimanded me. So therapy is not about someone co-signing your BS. <laughs> <laughs> therapy is 100% about you working on the situation. So she wasn't co-signing my BS at all. And when I left about it there, she says, uh, good luck this week because I know it's going to be rough on you. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to suck it up. And I had to have a different type of uh, relationship. And even now, my son is back home. We didn't think he would be here for t almost two years. And I went downstairs today. I told him, I said, I need you to prepare to leave by June the 1st. You're, I'm not mad, but your time here is over. It is time for you to go and be grown. So yeah, therapy uh, is very hard to find like-minded people who understand the life and grind of an entrepreneur. So it's very lonely at times. It is. But you're not alone. Yeah, I think you had a good office and around great people. <laughs> You're not alone. And that's what you have to keep reminding yourself. You're not alone, but you need to find that tribe of people who think like you. And that's often uh, very hard to do. I've had a lot of great collaborations and business partners throughout the years. And I've never stopped a business partner based on someone being unethical, ever. Everybody, I believe, all my business partners have been ethical. I have stopped business relationships because we don't grind the same. Like they're real nice people. They didn't try to take advantage of me. They didn't do any wrong by me. But, but we just didn't work at the same pace. Gotcha. Okay, so third question. Um, being a new agent and having been burnt badly in the past, I deal a lot with imposter syndrome. What is your best advice on how to combat that? Hmm. What I will tell you is you have knowledge now as a result of those past relationships. What I did not say, in every partnership I've had, even, even being a partner in a Keller Williams franchise, I never brought money to the situation. I only brought education. Every last one of these partnerships. But what I realized quickly is that people will buy into you being knowledgeable or having these past experiences and now knowing what to look out for, but their money runs out quickly. So by the time you do one or two things with them, you like, yeah, your money's not worth that. Because when people tend to be financial investors, they're 100% hands off. And you start calculating all of that time and energy right? What I want you to do is just get you a sheet of paper and write down everything that you have done, every skill set. And don't just write it in a day. Take a couple of days to write it, right? And think about even though you lost money, right? You lost money. That is what that is. 
That does not mean that you aren't knowledgeable. It doesn't mean that you weren't smart. It just means that you lost money, okay? So now you want to think about all those other great skills. You spent a lot of money in that flipping course, didn't you? You got got spreadsheets, you got uh, acronyms, you got a skill set. And think about how many people have not taken that course, right? So you want to sit down and think about all these different things that you're great at, and you want to turn them into your affirmations, keeping in mind that when people want what you have, they will always try to minimize what you have. And the way I think of it is, as real estate agents, people will say, um, you only do. You only do? No, we don't only just sell real estate. It's a whole long list of things, right? We we start to understand home inspection. We start to understand appraisals. We come to understand radon. We get in touch with uh, legal terms, right, and title issues, no, we do, we do more than just sales. So don't ever allow anyone to minimize you, but put in writing every single skill you have and affirm over those skills every single day. And when people are talking to you about you only, it is your responsibility to stop them and let them know what you bring to the table in a nice, polite kind of way. And I've come to weave it in because just to give you an example, I tell everybody I'm the shortest, darkest, roundest person in the room. So if you're around a bunch of men, they want you to feel inferior because you're women. Uh, You could be, they want you to feel you're inferior because you're black. Well, then you're overweight. So they view overweight people as being lazy. Then you don't have no hair. Like I can just go through this whole list, right, of all these isms that people have. So when they say whatever they're going to say, you know, it could be in real estate. And then I just hit them with the, what you mean, the 61 real estate related licenses, designations, and certifications, or is it the advanced degree, the MBA degree, right? Because oftentimes I say and do what I want to say and do it because I'm always smiling. They think that I'm silly. Well, oh, don't judge a book by its cover because my mother would tell people, she says, y'all think because Marky smiles, she nice. (laughs) My mother was like, my mother was a frowner. She was like, no, I'm nice and Marky's the evil one, right? And I'm working on being evil, but I don't, I can smile in your face just as nice, but I'm not going to let you put me down and I'm going to weave it right back in to the conversation so that we clear by the end of the conversation. And that is going to uh, be your responsibility that when you're having these conversations, you understand your true value because you wrote it down, you're looking at it, you're consistently reminding yourself of it so that it'll become second nature to you moving forward and you will be able to command whatever type of relationship you want moving forward. In saying that, I will tell you that the skill and knowledge that you have, just like you came with money the last time, right, and you lost a lot of money, there are people who will be willing to give you their money. And you will quickly realize that you want your own money because you already got the skill set. You you'll want to tell them to take their money and go kick rocks. And I would tell you that that's probably what you want to look at. How can you cultivate relationships where people come with money? Because there's a lot of folks got real estate dreams out here and they will give up money. I've had quite a few of them. And each time I've thought to myself, oh, I can't wait to get out of this relationship because they work in the heck out of me. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, so number four, you're always on your game, peak performance. You show up consistently every single day. How do you prime yourself to attack each day? And what's your best weapon on days when you just can't get your mind right? Well, first of all, I think you probably know music. <laughs> so I, I, I self-hype myself all the time. The number one thing is house music. If I put on some house music, 
I'm turning into badass Marky. I'm just, I got uh, on you. Um, it is the affirmations though. Um, it is the fact that I like to, the internet to me is my best friend. So I'm going to study and research whoever I'm meeting with before I show up for the meeting. And let me just say this, because you're newer to real estate, it is going to take just a little bit of time. But if you are consistently diligent with learning that one thing new, the more knowledge you acquire, the more comfortable you will become. So every single day, find that one little thing. And, and let me say this. I, I don't know if you all paid attention. I like to find that one little thing that people tend not to talk about. So at the moment that people ask you something that you might not know, you are able to educate them on something you know they don't know. Give you an example. Um, the fact that in Cook County, one third of all homers, homeowners never get their homeowners exemption, right? That means that one third of the people I come across with, come across with, they don't even get their own exemption on their own home. So that lets me know that most people aren't an expert on the subject. And one third of the people I come across I can put, who already own property, I can help. So that was one subject that I took it upon myself to learn more details about so that I could stand out in that space. But I am 100% committed to learning something new every single day. And before I go on a meeting or go into a meeting now, virtual meeting, I'm going to do a little bit of research before I show up. Also, uh, this is something I had to explain to my husband. I'm a strategic arguer. So if we were having a discussion. I shouldn't even tell y'all this. If we were having a discussion and you're trumping me, right? Or I know I don't know, I shut up. So I'm not going to just argue with you for argument's sake because I'd hate to lose an argument. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take some good notes. I'm going to go and I'm going to research that sucker. When I come back, and if I ever bring the same subject up again, it is because I have educated myself on said subject to be able to win any type of argument on the subject. That's how I win arguments in my house. See, my husband, he'll just argue to argue. I'm not doing that. I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to take a mental note, and I'm going to go research it. And then when I come back, uh, I'm going to be armed with all the facts. Here would be an example. And this wasn't even an argument. My husband never knew his, he wasn't raised by his biological father. So my mother-in-law mentions this man's name at Thanksgiving dinner. I can't wait to go write this man's name down. So I write the name down. Now, I remember, if y'all remember one of Oprah's last shows, Okay, when she had this sister that lived up in um, um, uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, that wasn't raised with her. She didn't know her mom had even had this dang on kid. When I'm watching the Oprah show, I had had this name written down on a sheet of paper. I go research this man. I know he from Haiti. I know that he was in Chicago at the time of conception of my husband because he had uh, come in as a expert witness, okay? I know the organization he's a member of because he is from Haiti and he's an outspoken pathologist. I researched that man. Next thing I know, I'm over his house on Google. I'm all up in the front yard, put the little Google man on the street, spinning around in the middle of the street, and I called his house. Yes, are you remember that episode? I'm serious. I remember that episode of Oprah. That's when I reached out to Jerome Masherin because we needed to find him. So um, research, knowing that little bit of knowledge that you know other people haven't taken the time to get to know, and one thing that I'm very good at is saying no. So I'm not trying to be an expert of everything. It's not enough time in the day. There is a book, uh, I think it's called Eat the Frog, that uh, tells you more about the ability to say, <clears throat> to say no to people. So you might know that my oldest son is now a real estate broker. I had put him on my calendar Sunday at 10 o'clock. He blew off 
one of our meetings. I politely took him off of my calendar. He is now walking around every day asking to get back on my calendar because he blew my time off. I am very protective of my time. And that is even with the people who I love because you only have so many hours in a day. They get to run around and do whatever they want to do. And if you don't make me a priority, I'm not going to make you a priority. And it might even hurt my feelings to not make you a priority. And I told him, I said, I might put you back on, but it's going to be one appointment at a time so that when you decide the next time you don't want to show up, you're not getting your, you're not getting another spot. So that might sound crazy, but just protecting your time so you can do all that dang on research so you can be on point. Um, and then living that schedule, thinking with the end in mind. So understanding the goals that you have and knowing what does not fit your schedule. So there was a time that I, a uh, big time shopper and I would go to the stores all the time. And I have an aunt, she'll be 90, and she still likes to shop all the time. And I told her, I don't have time to go shopping. Like, who, who, why, why would I want to go shopping now in the midst of a pandemic? I have a business plan. I have goals that I need to accomplish. I am not the person who's getting ready to run the streets with you just shopping to spend money, because that actually goes against the plan to spend money. I want a, I want a winter home. I don't have time to be spending money on the next pair of shoes. That That is not going to get me the one at home. I, and then actually, I won't need no shoes if I had the one at home. I could run around barefoot all dang on winter and ha have my feet hit hot pavement. Everybody's saying they remember when she, y'all remember that? That is when I reached out to Jerome. I <laughs> show <Sure> enough is. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Um, my next question is, we all know and love Facebook Live Marky. What is your best advice on how we can find our own authentic voice? Hmm. You know what? I'm going to give you two, two references that help me. One is Cal Draper. He's on Facebook. He is, I think he's a third or fourth generation youth minister. He's not from the world of real estate, but him and the past national president of the National Association of Realtors, which is Ron Phipps. I've had the opportunity to have classes with both of them. And they both state the same facts. And that was the fact that everyone has not had the opportunity to experience success but everyone has had the opportunity to have failures. And when they break it down based on the numbers, right? Like how many people have actually earned over $100,000 globally? Like the percentage is really small. And so I took heed to what they said in the classes. And I understand that I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of failures in life. I've had great successes, but I've had more failures than I've had successes. And they both, through their wisdom, allowed me to be able to share my failures. But I'm going to couple that with another lesson from my mother. Oh, she's Louise. This is like going to therapy with you today, girl. Okay. So growing up, um, I've always been very mature and grown. And I, would, I was that little fast-tailed girl. And my mother knew that I was a fast tail girl and that I liked older boys and that I always have had a boyfriend, okay? So with that being said, and my mother being a teen parent, um, my mother was very honest and candid with what she did not want for my life based on her personal experiences. My mother taught me at a very early age to own my BS. And that's how she put it. She says, Marky, people will try to make you ashamed of who you are in your experiences. She says, whatever you do in the dark is going to come to the light. I need you to own all your nonsense because then people can't shame you and make you feel bad for who you really are. So being, finding your true authentic self, I was raised to be open and honest about who I was 
And my mother would say things. So I already knew she knew who I was, right? It was the rest of the world who might not have known who I was. And so I've always kind I've always owned who I was. The older I get, the more I own it. Like 50 is the most freeing thing that ever happened. You know, I, I like, I'd be telling, I wish somebody would, right? I'm 50 <laughs> and get it with a whole new attitude because you're 50, right? Um, and to me, turning 50 allowed me to say exactly whatever I wanted to say whenever I wanted to say it. But I have been saying, I've been speaking my mind my whole life. It was because once again, my mother gave me the ability to be who I was. Hey, people come now. I remember you as fast. You was show sure enough was. Ain't no shame. And when I been married, my, when my husband, we started dating, I let him know, look, the man asked me, did I have a man? Yep, show sure enough got one. And I'm in a fragile, highly dysfunctional relationship. And anything short of me falling in love and getting married, I won't be leaving my man. That, so that kind of lets you know. <laughs> and he told me, I already knew you had a boyfriend. I wanted to know if you was going to be honest. <laughs> it kind of set the tone for your relationship that you would marry me and you knew I had to, I had to marry <laughs> and, and let me say this I don't want y'all to let y'all daughters date my sons because I would raise them by the same principle I said keep you a bunch of women I think men should date up until the age of 30 because I don't think they are ready to do nothing else until that age I said but at the moment you bring that girl home and you claim her you gonna do right by her so I'm pretty sure I won't be meeting any true girlfriends for quite some time. Because once you bring her home and you introduce her to me, I'm team girlfriend, team wife. I don't want to be friends with everybody, but I do encourage them to date a lot. So that once you get to that position, you settle down and you claiming her, she, she part of the family. I'm bringing her into the fold. And I'm going to protect her more than I'm going to protect you because I don't want you to do nothing to nobody's child that I wouldn't let anybody do to you. So there you go. Gotcha. And then I just wanted to make sure we have until 7.15. Girl, keep on with your questions. You got to, if you go over, you go over. God, I feel like I'm in therapy. Let me just get, <laughs> like, I need, let me kick my legs up. I'm on the couch. Who you have made me go deep in every emotion that I get. And I, what I'm realizing through our conversation, and I already knew this, um, the, the power that my mother had in my life. And I think the the biggest power was the fact that she acknowledged she was a 17 year old mother and there were certain things she wanted for me. And what she told me was straight up. She said, I don't believe, I don't believe you're any different than I am and have any different feelings. So what I'm going to do is prepare you the right way to be who you really are because how my mama raised me didn't necessarily work. Hence the fact why you here. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it Kim is ain't Kim. <laughs> Look, I'm gonna have to. We're gonna have to uh, broadcast this one, baby. A deep look at Marky's life. <laughs> Kim put her on the couch. Okay, come on, let's go. Um, okay, so if you want to be successful in any business, something I hear often is you need to find the right mentor. So, how does one find the right mentor, and how can you set yourself up so the right mentor can find you? This is gonna sound crazy. You got to volunteer. And I'm gonna tell you something. I pulled out the other day a Louis Vuitton briefcase out of my closet. I'm, I'm going to give you this story, then I'm going to answer the question. So I was the chairman of the Chicago Association of Realtors Education Foundation the year that we gave $140,000 in continuing education to our members. That foundation was started by Sheldon Good. Sheldon Good has sold billions of dollars of real estate as an auctioneer, and him and his company had the ability to call auctions in every city. His son was licensed in every single state of the United States of America. <clears throat> Here was what was interesting about that. We are leaving a foundation meeting. Sheldon Good, he drive a Rolls Royce. He lived down on North Michigan Avenue. He got a house in Palm Spring. I mean, like he got money galore. How about we walking down Michigan Avenue? He is carrying my Louis Vuitton briefcase. And we, for 30 minutes, we just walk and talk. I would have never had that opportunity had I not volunteered and was the chairman of the Education Foundation. Like you couldn't just get on Sheldon Goods 
calendar. What I learned early in volunteering was that volunteering will open doors for you that you could not open yourself, but it gives you access to people who historically their time cost a lot of money. But when you are in the trenches volunteering with people with something that is near and dear to their hearts, they will give freely to you. So when I went on the board of directors of the Chicago Association of Realtors the first time in 2006, when I would show up at the meeting, first of all, I'm gonna get there early. I'd walk in there, we get our coffee and we'd have some light pastries and I'd put my briefcase or bag on the table, but I wouldn't sit down. I was waiting for everybody else to come into the meeting. And at each meeting, I'd sit next to somebody I'd pick their brains. Now, I didn't call it, let me pick your brains. It was just casual conversation with somebody else on the board of directors. And I would lean over and we would share pleasantries and everything. But strategically, I could sit next to somebody and talk to somebody different based on what I read in the newspaper. I needed more insight. So to me, one of the greatest ways to be mentored by the most influential, successful people in real estate is to volunteer with them and be in the trenches. Get there early. And sometimes people, they volunteer, but they don't do it with a, with a grateful heart. You want to be the, the sunshine at the volunteer. What's going, again, this, this is me all the time, right? What's going on? Are oh, we here? We gonna get it on and pop in the day, how many bags we got to fill, whatever the activity is. I'm coming in, I am work, and let me, my work ethic was already from the barbecue restaurant, so I'm used to being of service to others. I, we need to organize them bags, we need to do whatever. Nothing was, is beneath me, and they know that. And as a result, when we on coffee break, water break, sandwich break, donut break, I'm sitting there and I got questions galore because I'm standing with Sheldon Good or Mike Golden or Thad Wong. Like I got access to every freaking CEO of every real estate company because I'm volunteering. So I can't, I can't. So now my volunteers are Frank Williams. Frank Williams told me I had to volunteer more in order to volunteer. Sounded crazy to me. But Frank Williams called the Chicago Association of Realtors and started my whole entire real estate education career with one phone call, okay? But it was because I volunteered. He told me to volunteer. He saw that I was volunteering more. So he threw your girl a bone. And then I remember seeing Terry Watson. I went to the Chicago Association of Realtors Southside office. I'm in the, I uh, went to go pick up a central. No, it wasn't central. It was a super lock at the time. And I'm looking through the doors. They had these two big double doors. They were open. I'm like, who is this dude? He's so dynamic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's my mentor now. And so time and time and time again, um, the volunteering has put me in alignment with the best mentors. One of the last people, uh, one of my newest mentors is David Knox. How did that come about? David Knox was speaking after me at the Realtor Conference and Expo. Terry Watson had just told me, Marky, you, oh, I got another story for you after this one. He said, you want to get an invite to go to David Knox's studio up in Minnesota. So I'm like, I don't even know David Knox, man. That man didn't see me, he didn't even speak to me, blah, 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 blah. I'm speaking at NAR. David Knox, he sees the end of my presentation. Now, David Knox likes to get there early, like an hour early to get everything set up, get himself situation, get himself in his frame of mind. Well, I got a long line of people waiting to talk to me. So now David like, we haven't had the opportunity to meet. What's your name? I'm like, I'm Marky Lemons Rao, David. I said, Terry Watson said, I need an invitation to your studio. Oh, closed mouths don't get there. 
So if you want something, when you get the opportunity, don't don't say, oh, I'm going to email them or call them later. You better say it right then and there. I said, Terry, Terry Watson said, I need to get an invitation up to your studio. I said, I heard it's lovely. He says, oh, Terry, boo. He says, yes, I think we could create content together. I would love to bring you up to my studio. Now, see, at first I was going to pay to go up to a studio. How about he fly me in, put me up at the Western over the uh, condo he live in because his condo is at the Western, just so you can kind of get an idea about this. He got a couple of Porsches, all this, right? We go to dinner, we record video. He bring me up a second time, just so you know. But let me give you the, the big one. There's a gentleman by the name of David Newman. He has a market, uh, do it marketing. I got his book up there. I decided to volunteer for the National Speakers Association. And I was doing Facebook Live interviews behind the scene. Because I volunteered for the National Speakers Association, they had a special reception, okay, for everybody. When I show up at the special reception, the president at that time says, Marky, we appreciate you volunteering. Who can we introduce you to that will make your life better? Oh, I don't know, but uh, I'm looking around. He was like, I'm gonna introduce you to David Newman. David Newman uh, had just went into what they call their six, seven figure club. So David Newman says, well, what can I do for you, Marky? I tell, I'm looking, I'm like, well, David, I don't know. Like, this is what I got going on. David Newman mentors me at the meeting financially changes my life in one conversation. I end up attending one of his classes, but as a result of volunteering, not only did David Newman, we got a relationship now, okay, who had just went into the seven figure club. How about when it was time to leave, to go to the airport, they come find me and I ride with the CEO, the president, the incoming president, for the National Speakers Association because I volunteered. Volunteer, that's it. <laughs> so you think about who you want to do business with. Do a little research on how they spending their time, watch them on Facebook on a Saturday, Sunday, cause that's when they are gonna do it. It might, they might not be as much today as it once was, but it'll be coming back in the next year. Put yourself where they are. And when it comes to volunteering, which is kind of funny, don't ever anticipate they're going to they're gonna go out their way to be where you are. It is your responsibility because you want to think about the value of their time. How do you make this convenient for them to pour into you without them knowing that their brain is being picked? Yeah. I forgot some of them stories. Yeah, uh, Terry is smart and funny. When I told Terry that story, both of them stories, actually, that's why I got a fern. Um, he just laughed. He said, Marky, how do you have this kind of luck? I'm like, well, one, I, I am strategic. I pay attention and I watch what's going on around me. Most people think because I talk so much, I'm not paying attention. I can do two things at one time. Um, and I don't mind asking, like speaking up, like, well, you know, what can we do? But I don't mind volunteering. And volunteering, I'm telling you, the connections you can get are freaking phenomenal. I couldn't afford them, folks. <laughs> I couldn't. Wow. She just said, wow. Yeah, I was, look, unreal. So now, of course, because I've done it before, I feel a lot more confident doing it uh, again. I'm gonna give you another example. At the Realtor Conference and Expo, besides the fact that I've been a speaker for, I think the last seven consecutive years, I was on, uh, I go into the Expo. I have a fellow Realtor with me out of Atlanta. I'm going from booth to booth. But now mind you, when I go from booth to booth, the people know me at the booth. So I don't have the little chotch, you know, the little stuff, the pants and stuff. That's not what they got for me. They bringing me t-shirts. So she looked, cause we about five t-shirts in at the Realtor Conference and Expo. So she looked, she said, Marky, first of all, how do these people know you, right? And how is it that everybody got your name on something 
in the doors that are closed, right? I said, well, because via social media, I already know we coming. I already know I want the best of the best of gifts. Hence the reason why you probably always see me in real estate paraphernalia. I said, I inbox them on social media. I let them know I'm gonna stop by their booth. I appreciate them. I tell them something about themselves. I said, and you notice every booth we go to, they know who Marky is. And they go and they pull me that extra large or that large t-shirt. Large if it's unisex, extra large if it's women. So she said, so that's how you do it? She said, because I don't have no gifts that look like your gifts. I said, because if I'm coming, I want the best gifts. So slide into the DM. Gotcha. Okay. Um, who... This is good. Let me just stop you. <laughs> Woo, y'all been bringing that heat on these hot seats. Lord have mercy. Okay, I got to start getting prepared for y'all. Lo okay, let me just take a deep breath. Okay. Whew. Good job, Kim. All right, I'm ready. Let me sip a little bit more tea. <laughs> Thanks. Um, who were or are the most influential people in your life and what are the top lessons you can share from their influence? Um, so some of this you might have heard. Um, number one would be my grandfather my father's father. A um, couple of reasons. When he found out that my mother was pregnant, my grandmother called him and he told my grandmother, he said, lemons take care of lemons. He said, anything that the baby need or want, you make sure you ask me for it. My grandmother told me before she ever passed away, she says, Marky, I will always respect Mr. Lemons, my grandfather. She said, I've never had to pick the phone up not one time to call for anything on your behalf because it was already taken care of. So when I got pregnant with my uh, oldest son, I was an unwedded mother. And I remember feeling, um, I guess I was satisfied because when I told my grandfather, he smiled and he chuckled. He said, hey, hey, hey. And I said, but I, I said, I'm not going to be with Robert. And he says, that's okay. He said, lemons take care of lemons. We'll take care of this baby in the same manner in which we took care of you. And that made everything okay. Like I knew Skyla was going to be straight, right? But the best business lesson that I learned from my grandfather, when I had my restaurant, the one that failed, there was a lady down the street, Miss Sue. Miss Sue owned a soul food restaurant and she had just, she used to work at this famous restaurant called Gladys's on the south side of Chicago, which was infamous for their soul food. So Miss Sue came down to Looney's, which was the place that I owned. And she says, um, Marky, we, somebody had told her my name. And she was like, I am interested in putting a barbecue pit down in the restaurant. I heard that you were born and raised a part of the Lemons family in the barbecue business. I got a few questions for you. I said, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I'll get back to you. So I call my granddaddy and I'm like, look, daddy, Miss Sue, she wants to know about this barbecue restaurant. And my granddaddy said, Marky, give her all the information. Now I'm looking at the phone. I'm like, is he crazy? Who does that? He says, competition is healthy for business. It'll make you better. Now, I want you to understand the point and where this came from. My grandfather came from Mississippi with nothing. One pair of shoes had holes in it. My grandfather and not one, but three of his brothers were all self-made millionaires. Three of them from the barbecue business, one due to his great investments in UPS, okay? So he took his stock options. He probably had the most money out of all of them. And so if you were to ever go into Famous Dave's Barbecue in the country, there's a picture of Lim's Barbecue. It is a part of their decor because when they wanted to open Famous Dave's, they came and talked to Mr. Lim's. When Charlie Robinson opened Robinson Ribs, it's another barbecue restaurant in the city of Chicago, Charlie Robinson learned how to hand trim his meat in our warehouse. So what I knew was that my grandfather was highly respected as an uneducated man in the world of real estate. Food and Paper Supply, their big distribution company, um, they, when they've been featured on TV, they've talked about James Lemons. When Mo and Oink, if you've ever heard their story, they will tell you their very first customer was my grandfather. He was their most faithful and loyal customer. And so 
uh, my grandfather, and then the next person would definitely be uh, my mother. My heroes are 100% within my family. And I think it's because we were all entrepreneurs and I decided to follow in their footsteps. And that was probably because I admired their work ethic and their contribution, not only to their families, but also to the community because both of them were very vested in the community. Um, getting close to the end. Um, it's this so, your time. So I'm you know, now look, I ain't been rushing nobody else. I ain't gonna rush you. So <laughs> get well, get I, your I, questions I, answered. I'm, Come on, man. Come so, on. Um, what are your top three best strategies for taking over a market um, that you're unknown in? Okay. I think I talk about consistency all the time. So if I'm thinking, I I can use High Park. <laughs> High Park is a unique community in the city of Chicago. Like they still read the High Park Herald in High Park. Okay. So they're reading that local newspaper. People wait for the High Park Herald to come out. Everything is on the internet, but they wait for the newspaper to come out. Make a long story short, we were able to penetrate the High Park market. I 100% believe you should join the Chamber of Commerce. Here's why. I was featured in the High Park Herald at least twice a month because I was a member of the chamber and the High Park Herald always, always came to take pictures of what the chamber was doing. So as a result of joining the chamber, networking in the community and in what I would call a cliquish community, they, they got clicks in High Park, then the newspaper that the people read they featured me. So I had a girlfriend, she passed away, but she was saving the High Park Heralds to give them to me. That's how often I was in the High Park Herald. It also aided me when the Polsky Center opened. I taught social media classes at the Polsky Center in High Park, but it's the Polsky Center at the University of Chicago. So now I got University of Chicago credentials but as a result of teaching at the Polsky Center, my face was on every flat screen television across the University of Chicago. I didn't have to pay for none of that. So the Chamber of Commerce to me, even now, if it was even online, you're going to show up, you're going to change your name to what you do. You're going to turn the light on camera ready. Some people have already experienced this. When it comes to these Zoom meetings, you want to just unmute yourself a little bit, click on something, and have this camera on because it's going to push you to the front of the feed, okay? And if you raise your hand, what the raising the hand does, I don't know if you probably saw this, but for me, it moved me over, okay? So there's a lot of things that you can do uh, online to strategically place yourself. So the Chamber of Commerce, being consistent, but also researching, understanding who those power players are in that community, finding that other little special volunteer so that you can get next to them to have dialogue and to see how you can be of service to them. But the Chamber, it changed everything, honestly, uh, in that community because it's, it is the, um, the center of the community. So I would say the chamber, being consistent and doing that research to understand who you, you need allies, so who you should strategically uh, work with. Now, let me come back though. Everybody I strategically work with, I like. So I don't ever want anyone to use me. So I don't use people. If I can't see that we're going to have a mutually beneficial relationship, I don't mess with them. So if you see me with people, kumbaya, know that I like them. If not, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to be on the other side of the room. I am not going to mess with you, have you draining my energy. So I'm, I am a protective around my little energy space. Uh, I don't like negative people and all that. Mm -mm, can't drain me. We got too much other stuff going on. So I need all the positive vibes and energy uh, coming my way. 
So it could be the most influential people in the community. If I'm getting bad vibes, I ain't messing with them. Now that means, that means we have fun and you enjoy doing it, which then means you'll be consistent in doing it. If you're not finding any joy in it, you're not going to do it. It's, they're going to think you're inconsistent. Oh, here's another thing. When you start to volunteer and volunteer more, you want to volunteer for where you can provide the most. Oftentimes we'll come in and there are certain things that we like to do, right? Just because you like to do it don't mean you're the best at doing it. What I've done is I come in and I understand my strong skill set. I want to give the best of my skill set so that I shine as a new volunteer. Once you shine, you can come in and make requests, but you got to shine first. Gotcha. Um, so next question is, which industry partners have been the most vital to your success and why? That's a tough one. Um, vital. I'm going to say lenders. And the reason is most of my interviews, Facebook Live interviews have been with lenders because I realize it is what the public wants to know. So there was a point that I was interviewing a lender once every single week, and it actually turned into lead generation. I would provide them with leads, and in return, they would sponsor all of my events. And now I've even had a little debate with the Chicago Association of Realtors because they have their own sponsors. Their sponsors weren't my sponsors. And they would say, but Marky, it's our CE course. I'm like, yeah, but I got my own sponsors. And so because we would do these Facebook Live videos, I would bring more visibility to them. I was generating leads for them as well that I always had more money. And I, now you at now I would just be honest. I want y'all to know this. This is my personal dang on business. So I'm going to just get put y'all up on a little bit of game. It is one of the reasons that me and Nicole Wheatley have had some of the most successful events ever. We got a lot of bank money. I just want y'all to know that. So when I'm telling you all to reach out to these lenders and to become their friends, then it's, it's more to that. So we were doing trolley tours, all sorts of things. All of that was sponsored by banks. Every last one of those events, because, oh, I'm a, so for those of you serving underserved communities, there's a lot of CRA money out here and they need more visibility in underserved communities, and they're willing to come up with money to manifest that. Um, so yeah, I would say um, lenders, now that I told y'all my business, uh, and how, we're, the, how we have had probably some of the most fabulous events you've ever seen on the Chicago South Side. I'm talking serving dishes, the best of food, music, beautiful trolleys, all of that. All of that money was sponsorship money, and it was because they understood our ability to be able to generate leads, and one of the ways to do that is Facebook Live videos. The next one, I'm just going to call out one company, would be Citywide Title. Back in the day, I was the queen of foreclosures. Um, Citywide Title wanted to get their attorneys in front of lenders because in the state of Illinois, this is going to be contingent upon the state that you practice real estate in, but in Illinois, um, the attorney builds the realtor relationship as opposed to states that don't use attorneys and the title agent would build the relationships. So for maybe three years, me and Citywide Title, we were doing an event together at least once a month with me helping them to build their strategic partnerships for their attorneys. So because I worked with them so long and it was a specific program, then I understand exactly how that program uh, worked. Lenders and citywide title, not every title company, I'm just telling you citywide title because of those programs. And all these programs have been sponsored programs. So if it was one thing that I would encourage every realtor to do, and that is to find uh, something that you are an expert 
act because people want to do business with thought leaders. Something you're passionate about, whether it's the finance side, whether it's the title side, whether it's just a purchase rehab product. So when you start thinking about in the city of Chicago, for those who know a Jennifer Ames or Emily Sachs Wong or Mario Greco, they are very niched. And that's why I encourage all realtors to be niched, because if you look at the top 5% of realtors in the country, when you say their name, people know what they do and where they do it. They're not trying to be of service to everyone else. So somebody wants to know, has the law changed regarding sponsorship in Illinois? What do you mean, Carla? So remember, um, I, I want to be clear about what we saying in regards to sponsorship. So for me, as a real estate educator, um, one, I'm compensated on the real estate education side. On the sponsorship side, if we were doing a trolley tour, and that trolley tour is for, uh, let's say, U.S. Bank, okay? U.S. Bank has a presence there. They're the only lender there. They have a booth that is there. They pay for everything. One, because we also have our own real estate school. So we also have our own facility and you can't use facilities for free. Just want to throw all that out there so that you are clear. We have our own space. Uh, we, okay, this is the difference. Yep, we have our own space. We have our own email marketing list. We are helping them. We are bringing them warm bodies. We putting 40 people on a bus, two buses. So we got 80 people hopping on buses. Yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit different, mm -hmm. but it's how you decide. So let me come back. So you want to be an expert because you can charge for education. So what's going to be your signature program? And that was something that was taught to me by a gentleman by the name of uh, Pashan Julian. A lot of people here who are in the state of Illinois might know Pashan. Pashan is, um, he's a CE instructor, but me and Pashan actually came into the world of real estate together as loan originators. And when uh, the Chicago Association of Realtors approached me back in 2006 to write a class for them, Pashan told me by no means should I sell them the class. He says, Marky, uh, keep the class and tell them you'll teach it on their behalf. And as a result, I earned more money that class, the first time I taught it, I went on to teach over 5,000 people that class over four years, just so, just so that we know. Actually, the ADPR, the Accredited Distressed Property Representative, we had it priced at 197. 5,000 people took it. That's a million dollar class, y'all. So Pashan, I owe him greatly but I owned, I owned that space, that foreclosure short sale education space. Uh, so, yep, you took it, Carl. I think that might've been when we met. And so you want to do that one thing that you gonna own, you gonna own it like nobody else is gonna own it. Uh, and then you can leverage that for numerous other things. Love it. I'm just taking, what, I'm waiting, I'm worried. <laughs> First of all, y'all got me telling, you know, I got 21 years in this game, right? And I've had the opportunity to um, try a lot of things out. I'm a trier, right? Um, I'm okay with failing, but I need to know if it works. So there's some things that people will propose to me. I know I'm based on past experience. This thing just ain't going to work. Like it, that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. No way, no how. But if I think in my mind, according to the research, that this could potentially pan out, I'm willing to try. I'm willing to not be successful for great successes. And all of my great successes in real estate have come from being willing to do something that most people would say no to only because the numbers supported that I should do it. It's not based on my a gut feeling. I'm going back. I'm doing research. Even if you looked at the new class that's coming out, me and Carrie doing our operation, uh, I've got houses for sale. Inventory has been the number one complaint. This is all I'm hearing. But I'm seeing tweets, Instagram posts, Facebook posts, day in, day out. I'm like, look, this, this moratorium, we waiting on foreclosure short sales. We already know that's our next move. 
we got to get this inventory and we don't want to list the property. We want to get all these buyers up off the bench. So be willing to take risks and see who is willing to invest in the risk so that you don't have to come up with any more money in order to level off that 2017, 2018 loss. Sounds great. I'm on my last two questions. So um, the next one is I've been married for over a year now to that same boyfriend. <laughs> so, Oh, he love you, girl. Let me just say that. He, Cause <laughs> yeah. you said boyfriend. So I was trying to figure out, I said, well, did she keep the man boyfriend at that time? So yeah. So 2019 was when we got married investment right here. <laughs> And so we're starting, uh, we're looking to start a family. So what advice can you give on how to best balance um, building up a career while starting a family? Because I don't want to overwhelm myself or basically leave one over the other. Like it has to be both. I would say you want to do the will of life. So inside of, um, I think the business plan, you want to look at your life and you, it's only so many hours in the week. How are you going to have everything that you want? Now, let me tell you this. You can have a successful career. You can have great kids and you can date your husband, but you just can't do everything for everybody. Okay. So you can have all those nice little components uh, in your life. But the question that you're going to ask yourself is what are you going to say no to? And what is going to be the priority of what you say yes to? And you want to take a look at that will of life and plot everything out. So if I was to go back to 2012, I've told people that my money was funny, my energy was zapped, and I did not have enough time to date my husband because I was doing entirely way too many things. And, the, and what I was trying to do, they were pulling at each other, as opposed to, I do a bunch of stuff now, but they all work in sync and collaboration with one another, as opposed to what I was trying to do that 2012 year. I read the book, The One Thing, and it changed, it changed a lot. Uh, one, there were some things that I eliminated, okay? Now, when I say my life works in sync and harmony, so right now we have the membership group. There's certain hours that I allocate to this every single month. I've actually put it, positioned it um, on my calendar first. I then fill in the remaining dates or availability with one hour keynote speeches for different real estate association, banks and title companies. I also have, I think it's 20 agents recruited that I meet with them and field their questions. Now we have the books, that's passive. Amazon sells those books. I have the t-shirt line that's over at all things real estate. The reason for the t-shirt line was because I'm in front of historically 100 face-to-face -face audience, but now it'll be 250 audiences. So this should say something, right? Okay, I put on a dress today, but this should say something so that the t-shirts sell. And everything that I do, I can take with me as long as I have a computer, right? Meeting with you, computer. Webinars, computer. If I go back on the road, I still be meeting with you in a hotel room, right? Everything packed up in my book bag, wearing that same t-shirt. So what you want to think about is one, you're going to spend some time at home. Two, you understand your role inside of your marriage, because everybody has a different role inside of their marriage. I'm not the I'm not the cook in my house. My husband and my sons are but everybody can cook in my house. But it's the one thing that I gave up because I don't do it the best, okay? My husband is fabulous at cooking, but my husband don't do any laundry. And he don't like to change the bed. So changing the bed and doing the laundry is 100% my responsibility. On Sunday morning, I am at home doing laundry. I do laundry every week. I don't like laundry to pile up, none of that. Every week, I'm doing laundry. All right. So, but that's on my calendar and my husband likes me to do his laundry. I've sent stuff to the laundry service, but because I don't have other responsibilities, my husband likes me to do his laundry. It's like the one thing he loves for me to do. So to make him happy, I do his laundry and I don't complain about doing his laundry. 
because there's so many other things that I don't do, right? So you want to sit down and look at that will of life, look at where you are, you might do two of them, where you are, where you want to be, and what are some of the things that you can do at home that allow you to transition into, into the mommy role where it won't create conflict? For me, my life changed overnight because I married my husband in June, got pregnant in July. I didn't think it was going to happen that fast, to be honest with you. Um, went through a high-risk pregnancy, had to slow down. And then my youngest son was not the extrovert that my oldest son is. So I had to kind of pivot because Austin was not trying to be friendly. He was not trying to have no parts of dealing with folks. And I had to essentially accommodate him, which allowed me to kind of pivot the role. Um, and so I think long term most definitely, but you can make money in real estate not just selling real estate. There's so many other ways to make money in real estate. Think about all these skills. Think about workbooks. Think about how uh, investments gone wrong. You could write a whole story and pivot everything you learned in 2017 and 2018 to be beneficial to other people. How do you take that and turn it into a story or a notebook? or include what you learned and, 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 and it'd be the guide on how not to fail in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, you can have it all. You just can't do it all. And I know that oftentimes, especially for women, we feel as though we can be all things to all people. It's, it's only so many hours in a day and you want to look at those hours in a day, and you want to put that sleep time in. So I sleep an average of seven and a half hours per night. Most people don't believe me, but your girl is serious about her sleep. If I don't get sleep, I am a wildebeest. Don't nobody like non-slept Marky. I can tell you that right now. So I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to turn my phone off. I'm going to get my sleep. I'm going to get up refreshed the next morning. We ready to go. So sleep is very important to me you have to decide what's very uh, important to you. Learn to say no and live your life according to that schedule. Make sure your t voicemail reflects the life and when you're going to return phone calls. Um, and most people can, uh, if you've ever called me, you could probably regurgitate to me my voicemail uh, because it's, it's the same rules and regulations. I let people know when I'm going to call them, when I'm not going to call them. And my aunt, uh, I think I've mentioned her before, She'll send me messages. Tell your mom to call me on my preferred method of communicating because she likes to talk on the telephone. Uh, so for her, I had to pick up the telephone and call. Okay, last question. What impact do you want to leave on the world? Um, the impact that I want to leave was not initially what I thought I wanted to leave. Initially, I wanted to leave a legacy. But what I'm realizing time and time again recently is that um, African-American young ladies are feeling empowered. They feel as though they can be their true, authentic self as a result of T.T. Markey being her true, authentic self. So the mark I would want to leave on the world is that you can have success on your terms being your true authentic self. And in the process, you can leave a legacy. So I can leave a legacy to my two sons. But to me, um, I want to give a part of what my mother gave to me to others, because I think that everyone needs a hazel. Now, one thing we did not talk about, so I want to be clear, um, when it comes to my mother, because I, I like to clarify this, my mother uh, started using drugs when I was 18 years old. She was a perfect, ideal mother until I turned 18 years old. And then we went through a 15-year heroin addiction. My mother went to drug rehab in 2003, and she kicked her heroin habit. My mother died in 2006 from a brain aneurysm. The greatest gift that my mother gave me was overcoming her heroin addiction because she taught me through overcoming her addiction that anything was possible. 
So just when you think, you know, it could get no worse. And it wasn't this, just the fact that my mother was an addict. My father was an addict, but my father was an addict my entire life. So to for 15 years, I wanted to just choke my mother because she had morphed into a person I no longer knew. But baby, when she got clean, and let me tell you, this is what happened. So I was rehabbing a house over here on 68th and St. Lawrence. I'm complaining about money because when you rehab in a house, you know, one day you could you close a deal, you got a whole lot of money. Okay, you could have a couple of hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Oh, you feel rich. Then you go buy you another house and you go buy your supplies and your couple of hundred thousand dollars ain't sitting in the bank no more. So I'm like, you know what? My money is funny. Rehabbing this house. And I was rehabbing more than one house. So I was complaining to my mother about rehabbing these two houses. I'm like, look, I don't even have time to go get my hair done. I got to pay for summer camp, for uh, Skyler, all these things. And my mother said, oh, I'm going to help you out. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I get this little card in the mail. And I still got the card till this day. And in the card, I finally sit down at the end of the day to open the card and read it. So my mother told me she was sending me $500 uh, for Skylar's camp. So when I sit down, I'm reading the card and my mother is like, girl, you sound too stressed for me on the telephone. She says, pay for Skylar's summer camp. And while you at it, you need a beautification day. Go get your head done, your nails done, and a massage. And then she says, period, because Hazel is back. And I'm sitting there because all I see is this $500. So I take the money orders and I do like this. And it's two $500 money orders. That had me on that front porch broke down in tears because I said, my mama is back. Because that was the Hazel that I knew. That Hazel who would put that extra oomph on it. She like, girl, look, you so stressed. <laughs> Go take it, get you a beautification day. And it's on me. So, uh, yeah, I, wanna, I, want, I want everybody to be able to see the possibilities that my mother allowed me to see in good times and bad times. Oh, Y'all, I'm going to have to go get me a cocktail. <laughs> She's Louise. Great questions, Kim Tracy. You had me on my couch. Girl, look, I've been to therapy tonight. Woo-wee. Uh, thank you, Marky, for keeping it 100. Yeah, y'all, everybody need them a little hazel in their life. My mother, she was really, uh, she was cold with it, um, even in the midst of her uh, addiction. That was an excellent job. Girl, come on now. You got this. Appreciate you for showing up, being vulnerable, willing to share. Uh, you can do it. I, clearly, you are an investment, right? Y'all in this to win it. And uh, I can't wait to see our little real estate babies one day, y'all. We're going to have around here. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marky. I appreciate Th you.